Hey, hey everybody. Um, do I have to stand here? Is that true? True fact? Okay. Um, um, I'm Leif. Uh, thanks for coming. And thanks to Vivka and Samin for organizing the session. Uh, really great and fun to listen to everything. For me, uh, do it. So I've been working on these sort of methody things for a while, and so I go to occasionally to these meetings, and overwhelmingly, I have the increasing sense that uh, I have nothing, nothing to say to anybody, that it's already covered, right? So I don't need to say pre-register because that's covered. I don't need to say, oh, we should be thinking about replications. Man, Rich did a way better job of that than I would ever do, right? And, and Chris brings a perspective that I'm less familiar with, but it's this, again, an argument that I would love to be able to make coherently to say, like, what are the trade-offs we're thinking about? So that's usually around the point where I tell myself, I should just turn down uh, this. And so instead I say, you know what, I'm going to do something new, which is uh, I was going to present uh, this amazing project. I don't know if the project's amazing, but I think that title is super great. <laughs> uh, it's the best title I've ever had in the sense of I had a half dozen people email me over the past few months to tell me that they were sick and tired of my crap on this topic based on just the title, <laughs> uh, which I think is, I think is awesome. Uh, but, but the downside is that we're, we're only 90% done with the project, so uh, Yuri, Joe, and I decided that uh, I wouldn't present it. So I'm going to present this thing over here, uh, which I'll talk about today. Now, the, um, the other thing uh, that's worth noting, so I, I, I work in a business school, um, which is neither here nor there, except for it means that I'm extremely familiar with a, a speaking norm where people ask me questions continuously. So have you ever met an MBA student? First of all, you know it, like they'll tell you. Uh, and second, they will identify themselves by, by answering every possible question, right? So you ask, remember the good old days? They're like, yes, right? And so that is my assumption about how all talks go. So I'll talk. And every time you're like, I have a question, you just ask. I'm, the amount of content I have, if you just let me go, will last upwards of seven minutes. I don't even know how long I'm supposed to go, but it is more than seven minutes. And so there's plenty of time. Uh, okay, so I'm not doing the meta-analysis one. I, I, on the other hand, it is a real project, so I'm uh, happy to answer questions about it or whatever and be dogmatic. Um, but instead, I'm going to talk about this thing. So I'm going to talk about how Ambiguity in analytic specification, like how you decide to analyze the data, uh, poses a significant problem for how we draw inferences. I'm going to lay out our solution, which we call specification curve. Uh, it's a paper that we've written. It's posted on SSRN. It's under review someplace. OK. Um, I'll also talk very I have like two slides on this thing at the end that I mostly think is a neat feature about how we think about the two brands of, if you will, false inference that I, I'll think about here. One is the truly false positive, like, oh, that's just a rose due to chance, and the other one is uh, you're fishing around until you find an analysis that works, but it's true because you're missing a confirm. Those are different forms, and I'll talk about how the former is hard to fix. Okay, that's just at the end. All right, so experimental psychology, uh, we've, everything's, everything's fixed. Uh, I don't even know if Eli's here anymore, but he had this great line where he said, everything has been staggeringly successful the last few years, which I think is a pretty good description. High fives all around. <laughs> so now, now that we've figured that out, now we're going to ask about people who, who do non-experimental non work, where they, they get sets of data and they look at how variables are related to each other. Um, and that's uh, a lot of different folks. So even if you consider yourself, so I'm, I'm, I, I do work that is massively less interesting than what you do. Just looking at Lauren's list, like that's embarrassing. Couples oriented vibrators? Wow. I do hypothetical willingness to pay for a bag of oranges, stuff like that. <laughs> uh, so in any case, but I, but I do experiments, only experiments basically. But even then, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that one might measure, and so you're in this realm of like, well, how do I think about that stuff I'm merely measuring? But for our purposes, I'm going to call everybody who does these things, I'm going to call them economists. And that's because, A, economists do that but also because it can make us feel for a brief moment like it's not on us, it's someone else's deal. Because economists, what they do for a living largely is they get these big piles of data and they're like, We're, I'm going to show how reforms in education lead to changes in income, something like that. And you're like, oh, that sounds pretty good. No experiment involved, analyzing data, what's going to happen? Right? And you say, so they live in that world. If you can run experiments, then you're talking about 
Like for me, the replication notion is, of, of course, that's one of the main benefits of running experiments is because you can run replications and so on. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about economists. What does p-hacking look like in economics? Well, they run experiments occasionally. Their experiments uh, are too tedious to even think about, but for the time being, they, it means that they're susceptible to all the regular p-hacking stuff that, that we can do, uh, including reporting different measures and different conditions and all that. Uh, for whatever reason, they're really into non-random assignment culturally. That's just, again, because they're economists. Uh, I don't really know why. And then there's ambiguity in specification, because they collect big, complicated data they can analyze in lots of different ways with lots of other measures besides the random assignment. They run field experiments. It still has experiment in the name, so you can still p-hack things, again, dropping measures and conditions and whatnot. Um, lots of moderators that they, that they measure. And there's ambiguity in how they analyze that. That data is often complicated, lots of ways to think about it. And then there's observational data. This is the core piece that I'm thinking about for the time being. That's where they just get a big set of da data and they can do their basic psych p hacking. Uh, and then also, there's ambiguity in how they specify it. And it's that notion, the ambiguity in specification, that's the core of what we're thinking about. And so when I say ambiguity of specification, I'll go through a couple of examples and talk, and talk through what I'm thinking about. But this is the idea that you have some set of data and you could just run a simple t-test on it. Or you could log transform the data and then run a t-test on it. Or you can control for gender. Or you could do a logit test. Or you could do a probit. Or, and so on, right? Those are all plausible, right? And if you're in this room, you're aware of that, and you've done all of those things either because you're learning or because you're p-hacking or because why not? Okay, so we're all on the same page. Here's some examples, again, from the econ literature so that we can all feel good about ourselves. Uh, one of the most famous papers from the last uh, 25 years uh, is by Colin Kammerer, Kammerer arguing that taxi drivers uh, are not wage maximizers. This is a psychological phenomenon. They go out and they collect data and they, and they drive their car until they reach a goal for that day, then they go home and go to sleep. And that means they're not maximizing because they fail, they're failing to capture that there's fluctuation in demand. On a rainy day, if you work for 10 hours, you make much more money than if you work for 10 hours on a sunny day. So you should work more hours on the rainy day, fewer days on this, fewer hours on the sunny day. All right. So he publishes that in the American Economic Review, which you can think of as some version of Psych Review and JPSV all bundled together into a journal that you'll never read. All right, so, uh, but that's that. Then, uh, some years later, uh, Farber argues, uh, no. And then uh, he says, no, wait a minute, three years later, same guy, analyzes the data, says, maybe, but it varies by day, and then later some other people come along and say, no, it's actually just totally right. The first thing that we want to observe about this brief narrative here is 1997, 2011, right? Imagine that this last answer is the correct one. It took us all those years to get there. That is slow. And in between, these are people fighting with each other. Better form of fighting is another famous paper. This is uh, where the trying to find out whether competition between schools uh, leads to better education. Now, how do you do that? You don't randomly assign schools, and so, like clever economists, they say, this economist uses uh, the placement of rivers, which is sort of like, that's nature's way of creating random assignment out there, and saying, oh, on different sides of the river, you'll have different forms of competition. And so says, uh, yes, you, there, there is, a competition does, does do something, and uh, some five years later, again, Econo American Economic Review, Rothstein says, no. Hawksby then uh, follows up and says, yes, uh, and is super upset about it, to which Rothstein <laughs> says, no, just as upset. And so now here it is, seven years have passed. This is a lot of time, and what we've learned is functionally that we don't know the answer and that these guys should not be hanging out together. <laughs> right? So that seems like an unsuccessful form of science. Uh, this one you might know about because it's talked about in Freakonomics. Um, so uh, Levitt uh, su suggests that uh, legalizing abortion uh, reduced crime 18 years later uh, and has data on that. Uh, then these guys come along and say, no, that's wrong. Levitt and, and Donahue say, yes. Great. Uh, again, some number of years, and the answer is not obvious. 
more recent. And this one is great because it's, it's active. And so this is a project that uh, Brian and his group, uh, our, Brian, our, our designated prophet, um, uh, was, a, was able to uh, put together with, with these two guys and then a bunch of others. But what they did is they collected a set of data that looked at the assignment of, of red cards in soccer matches. And they asked the question, uh, hey, does the race of the player influence whether or not they get a red card? One set of data, one fairly straightforward question. And then what they did is they got 29 highly competent research teams. Like that is not to say, you know, just some person says, hey, I'll look at that data. These are all teams that are well-trained in econometrics and they say, give me the data and I will draw an ant, I will dr derive a conclusion and then we'll do it all independently and we'll see what they all look like. This chart, granted a little bit hard to see here but you, but I'll walk you through it it's basically plotting for those 29 different groups what their point estimate of the size of the effect is all the way down here on the left this says that it so the line here is that it's equally likely regardless of what the color of the player's skin is that they'll be given a red card and then going up these are larger and larger effects in the form of if your skin is darker you're more likely to get a red card okay so you can see there's range, some of them are red, some of them are gray, those are significant, non-significant. The main thing we want to see is that none of them are the same. Same data, same hypothesis, everybody's well trained, no one agrees on the answer. Now what's cool about this as opposed to the rivers or the taxi drivers is that this all happens in parallel. Imagine the same narrative played out in the American Economic Review. Now we say, that's 2015. By the time you're over here, these are our grandchildren writing these papers, right? Because everything moves slowly. Here, we get to see it in parallel. Look, there isn't agreement. So you say, okay. That is our problem, and we want to solve that. We want to say, how can we get in, how can we think about these, ar these arguments and think about how to resolve ambiguity and specification? Because <laughs> the, the form of just, we'll figure it out over time, isn't working great. Please. Absolutely. What do you mean they're all different? It looks like two thirds of them are basically identical. Okay. I'm talking about obviously. You're saying <coughs> these guys are all, all about the same point estimate. So it's not the same point estimate, and they all acknowledge that there's a certain error. Of course, their estimate of the magnitude of the error is relatively. Uh, it, they differ from each other, but even the estimates of the magnitude of the error are very similar in most of these cases. I mean, there's like four that are dramatically different, and a couple that uh, seem to think that they're very. So the observation is, I make, I make the claim that I look at this and I say, that's 29 different estimates. You make the claim, I think quite reasonably, well, yeah, but they're, they're similar estimates. Similar and the same are clearly different in ways that, meet, that matter a lot to us. Consider this estimate right here and this one right next to it. They have the same point estimate, let's call it the same for our purposes. This person published in AER, this person next to it said that they were full of crap, right? They're about the same, but only one of them is significant, right? And that's the small form. These guys all the way down here, they're saying the effect is zero. You say, well, they're ridiculous. But if they published first, then they're the ones that, are, that have that, that burden, that, the strength of saying, like, well, you have to disprove me. So even if there, are, if there is some agreement, the agreement's going to be useful, right? It's going to be a big point of what I want to talk about, that, hey, you want to understand the range of possible specifications. But the range, these are all... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Bruce, he's, yeah, well, I mean, I'm almost done if you want to. Uh, so when, 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 whenever, uh, well, Bruce will be fine. I'll, I'll just, I'll let her know uh, by Xing out, because uh, now, now she'll be fine. Um, so, so, there, so there's some uncertainty, and I'm going to return to that range of how, of how wide the specifications can get, and how we can think about sort of what, what the, if you will, like the true answer would be. Now, this figure uh, represents extremely poor planning on my part in terms of font size. Um, <laughs> imagine that for one researcher, there is some set of specifications that represents the entire world of things you could do with this data. 
And then that researcher takes a position like, well, but only some of them are valid, this blue circle of people. And then that researcher says, yeah, and some of those are different from each other, but th these are the ones that are non-redundant that I care about, that are within that set. And then there's this thing that's really tiny font, that little gray dot. That's the one they do. Right? That's the one that, they, that they're like, see, we did it. That's our finding. Right? And think of all these as that gray dot in a world of big circles. Okay? So you say, all right. Meanwhile, they have collaborators. They have similar views. Now there's error, right? Hey, we, we're going to analyze it in similar ways, but different, su different subsets of data are analyzed, different analyses, but they're pretty similar. But we have with slightly different point estimates, but they come from the same universe. Well, how about someone else with a competing view? They also see all the possible specifications, but now what they see as a valid subset is actually quite different from the original researcher. It's all drawn from the world of, hey, we can do it. But slight differences in, in their perspective lead them to completely different inferences. OK. So you say, great. No, and this is going to be sort of a repeated theme. Oh, I'm supposed to stand here. Uh, is a repeated theme, and that is that I will, as much as possible, avoid taking a position on who's right, largely because one of the fun parts of this project is that unlike most of the other things that I do regarding methods, I'm going to try to stake a strong claim that in these domains, we should avoid claiming who's right. We should be saying, show me everything. OK. And so we're going to take both of these and think about them in parallel. So the status quo is that when we assess the robustness of a particular specification, uh, we do nothing. So that is to say, assessing the robustness is rare, period. We run some analysis, and there it is. I told you it was going to be a fixed effects logit after controlling for gender and eliminating anybody who's more than three standard deviations from the mean. That is the correct specification, end of story. It's slow to fix it over time, right? This is the 1997 to 2011 trying to figure out the taxi cab thing. So when someone else is trying to, ass trying to assess the robustness, it, learning is, is as slow as the publication process. It's always costly. Every time one researcher tells another researcher, I think you did it wrong, the original researcher is upset, the new researcher's uh, reputation is on the line, everybody's less happy. So that seems problematic. And in the end, it's inconclusive. So if Chris runs an analysis and I say, Chris, I think you're wrong, Chris thinks he's right, I think I'm right, no one knows who's right, all they know is that we complain to each other. Right? That's not good learning. <coughs> So it's worth trying to find something that's better. And it's going to be better conditioning on the idea that we're not trying to say what's conclusive. We're just trying to say what is everything. OK. So that's, we're going to call it a specification curve. And at some basic level, all it's going to be is looking at every possible specification, arraying them in a way where you can see them all at the same time, and understanding which, which decisions in the analysis matter most. OK. So authors list their oper operationalizations they made. You can think of any number of possible things. And for each, all the sensible, plausible alternatives. And then we're going to look at all the combinations. Right? This is instead of living in the world of finding one specification. So here, uh, none, none, of us, none of us are, ec are economists, but there's this neat narrative that economists used to be just like, like the, here I'm going to make them briefly sound better than us, but bear with me. They used to be just like us in that they would have one specification period for their entire project. They're like, yep, there it is, point estimate, 13% increase in profit. And then, sometime around the 1980s, people started noticing the specification issue, and they're like, really, you got to show us a couple of other versions. And so that's what they landed on, like typically two other versions of the same analysis. But we're talking about a world where there's dozens, hundreds, or thousands of alternatives. And it probably it was some point in the past where that was computationally implausible. But of course, it's trivially easy to look at many, many different specifications all at the same time. OK, so I'm just, and then we'll just plot them. So what's that going to look like? This goal is to facilitate debates about specifications. Right? Rather than trying to say, we have the correct version, because every specification can be justified. There's um, one of the, and maybe we've mostly gotten past this, but one of the early debates in talking about p-hacking uh, was characterized by Klaus Fiedler, who would say, I have never p-hacked ever in my career. 
right? And probably lots of people have said it. But his argument was, because isn't p-hacking the thing where you do those bad things and they're completely unjustified? And you're like, no. The whole idea is that they're all justified. You drop the outliers, of course it's justified. Justifiable. Justifi justified to me, right. justifiable to you. Exactly. And, and you say, well, wait a minute. All specifications can be justified. They are all justifiable. And so you say, well, wait a minute. Well, now, let's not live in a world where, we're, in this domain in particular, where we're trying to find the right one, except that multiple versions could be right. And now, show me all of them so that we can argue about it. So other people have talked about this. Uh, this is a handful of issues about what, how you can do it, and mostly I'm borrowing from the way economists approach their data, but it applies to us as well. So let me give you a couple of examples. The first, uh, so the AER uh, required data posting back in 2004. Uh, sorry, it's aside, seriously, the economists are ahead of us by 10 years on that. Like, and their data sets are big and complicated and expensive. Ours are mTurk studies that cost me $13 and took me four minutes to collect. It's okay if the journal decides to force me to post them. So in any case, so if all the data is posted since 2004, uh, this is the second most cited one, uh, and it's one that I choose as well because you'll know it, even if you don't read this journal. This is an audit study uh, looking at likelihood of being uh, called for an interview as a function of whether your name is, uh, stere is stereotypically African American or white. Okay. And so these are famous economists who, who do this, and they send out resumes, and they count what happens. Great. So there's a couple of things. Uh, they do it in a few different places. Here I'm just p pointing out that they do it in different cities, uh, males and females, different types of roles. There's sales jobs, administrative jobs, and so there could be gender matching and race matching, a bunch of things that are possible to extract from the data. Um, this is subtle, but it's worth pointing out, and just for this, so I can walk through it, they want to they have a measure for how high quality the, the resume is, because they're going to make an interaction prediction that says the white-black gap matters more when the, when the quality of the resume is low than when the quality of the resume is high. Sounds fine. So they build these resumes that are either high quality or low, re low quality, but there's some subjectivity to how it's done. There's different resumes, and so they, want it, so they end up predicting the quality of the resume from a, from a holdout sample it's a little bit complicated, but just suffice to say, the fact that I'm telling you it's complicated says, I bet there's more than one way you could have done that. There's more than one way they could have done it. So I'm just pointing out some of the ways they could have, and I'll show you as we go. Here it says uh, different covariates. Uh, they have covariates that they use in their primary specification for the city where it's done, uh, different occupations, uh, then job requirements and whatnot. Handful of variables that are controls, all plausible and reasonable. Uh, but they could have chosen none of them. They could interact female in city or not, uh, that is gender in city. Occupation as a fixed effect, in any case, handful of things they could have done, all of which are reasonable. So you go through different subsamples, different definitions of quality, different sets of covariates, and you end up with 656 possible specifications using exactly the variables that those authors laid out. Right? This is not me fishing for alternatives. These are the alternatives that their very write-up implies are all reasonable. So say great, and I'm just and we're going to run a regression where we predict callback rates as a function of the race of the applicant, the quality of the resume, and the interaction of race and quality, right? Just like they did in theirs, except we're going to do it with each of the different specifications, all of the stuff that's different. Okay. So first of all, walking through this this simple slide, and it's in for the time being, small font doesn't matter because I know it's hard to read, but I'm going to the verbal description is what's going to sell it. So uh, these are all our subsamples. You say, okay, this is, these are all the analyses where it use all the data. This is where you specify Boston or not, and so on, each of those. Here it is for each of the definitions of quality. Here are all the specifications for each of the covariates. Just all, that's all the seven, 756 dots that are up there, basically. And these are all the effect sizes. Now, that's not very useful. These are all their point estimates of how big the effect is. But now we're going to use fancy technology of sorting. Um, and then we end up with this. And now, what this tells us, think about that soccer plot, where there are 29 different versions of it. This is 756 different estimates of that, of that effect, all plotted next to each other. And now you can look at them and you say, and you can now see how many of them are below zero, how many of them are above zero, 
And as, as we can point out, how many of them are statistically significant? And you say, 24 of the 756 specifications are statistically significant, are significantly different from zero, right? Now, that doesn't make the inference wrong or right, but wow, that is a useful piece of information that if I had waited for 756 different papers to be written on this topic, would have been very frustrating. But now, as an author, we get to put it out there. We say, well, and, they, and these dots, these two red dots, those are the ones they report in the paper. Right? Those are the two specifications they talk about for, for the quality by ethnicity interaction. Of the 24, 16 are negative, eight are positive, eight are in the, in the direction opposite of their core prediction. Right? So that's also you know, vaguely disconcerting in terms of this. Uh, and here, this is a note just to myself, so it's not to you. Um, uh, this is late talking to late now. Uh, <laughs> Pre-registration, uh, so uh, as with many of you and for these descriptions, I pre-register essentially everything I do. Or when I mean that, I mean I have my graduate students or my undergrads do it. Like, they pre just like, why not? Just go ahead and pre-register it. But pre-registration uniquely does not solve this problem. As someone who, who wants to find out about how ethnicity and quality of resume influence each other in terms of callback rates, I don't, I don't care that you pre-registered your, your hypothesis, that's fine and all, but I want to know about everything that's possible because I want to understand what's going on, right? And so it's not a pre-registration issue, it's a transparency of analysis issue. Now, that was for this effect that was kind of iffy. Let me show you in the same paper, here's the main effect for what, for, of, of ethnicity on callback rates. Plot it again, each of the different subsamples, all the different specifications, and here, it might be hard to see, but every single specification is suggesting that there is a, there's a negative effect of having an African-American name on callback rates. Right, so you say, of those, 540 have a p-value less than 0.05, right? That looks like a different type of evidence than the first one, right? And so, we've, and so we can learn something from that, yeah, Eli. Um, I know that the main focus you have is not on the content itself, but I think I'd understand your procedure a little better. Do you know what those like disjoints are? Is that like some variable of your six is crucial? So, uh, yeah, that. your point of these, these yeah. two things. So it's hard it's hard to pull out of this chart, right. but notionally, if you if if we, ah, if we were out there with a with a magnifying glass, <laughs> we would see discontinuities in the different, and you basically find out. Oh, it's the presence or absence of a particular covariate has a, has a uniform effect. So everything with that covariate is lower. And so that's why you get these. And so you basically learn from that, everything looks good, but Eli, what Eli spots there tells you, whoa, a couple of covariates matter a lot, right? Let's look into those. Let's see what, they, what they're doing in this analysis. Here's my second example um, that also you, you're familiar with. And I, I'm going to kind of pick on it, but I don't mean to. Like it's, it's, I, I'm way late to the party if I'm just going to pick on this paper. Um, but basically here the argument is that uh, her female named hurricanes cause more damage because people are like, uh, women aren't that dangerous, so I'm not going to leave town, and so more people die because they don't leave town. So that's this, this prison PNAS. Uh, and if you're wondering whether or not this, this is influential, um, the, the dean of hiring in a recent meeting uh, cited this as a reason that we should be wary of, of gender bias. For example, the hurricane paper, um, which is you know persuasive. Uh, okay, so um, in any case, this is kind of neat. A lot of people criticized it, but it ends up being kind of fun to look at in terms of specification curve because it's complicated. These are their decisions. Which storm should, should they analyze? How should they operationalize whether or not a hurricane has a female name or a male name. Which covariate should they include? What type of regression model? What the, what's the functional form of femininity? These aren't tricky questions. They're questions that we would all answer if we had to do this. And they decide on things. They exclude two outliers that had the most deaths. They thought they were extreme. Uh, they decide to code femininity on the 11-point scale of femininity. Uh, property damage in dollars, interactive femininity. You can read all the stuff. Here I'm pointing out some alternative specifications none of which I think are even directionally uh, like problematic. They're like, sure, that sounds good too. For example, you could drop only one outlier. Or you could drop outliers on their critical covariate, which is how, what the property damage was of the, of the hurricane. 
Um, you can categorize names as being male or female as they were designated by the person who was naming the hurricanes, uh, and so on, a bunch of things. Okay, so now we go through, and here is the same type of specification curve for that. And what you'll see here, uh, the, red high, the red notes I'll walk through, this is, but you see some distribution is all the effects that are possible of the 1,728 different specifications based on those, those six e e issues. And then you can, see, and you can look at it and you see, whoops, here, first of all, we're seeing that very few of that data set show an effect in the opposite direction. If, don't remember, these aren't independent, so we shouldn't think of this as like, this is 1,728 different experiments and only a few of them, no, it's, the data is the data. So, but we say very few have a negative specification. And you'll note all of them have particular specifications where there's density in how it's, how it's identified. There's a few other things that are notable. So they use a, bino a negative binomial regression. Um, my guess is you don't know what a negative binomial regression is. I didn't know what it was until I read this paper about hurricanes, right? But those are the, all of the, na those are the ones that generate big effects. If you use a, a regular log, lo ba basic logit type regression, the effects are all smaller, right? So you say, so that clearly matters a lot this decision that they made. And then you can also see that only 37 of the, of the 1,700 specifications are statistically significant. For all of the criticism this paper got, and there's two different published comments in PNAS, plus Andrew Gelman writing, basically using this as a catchphrase for describing anything that's crazy and dumb, uh, which is mean of him. I'm not, I really, I'm not really trying to undermine the original authors. Uh, like, for all of that, Something like this makes the entire paper interpretable from the very beginning. Right? You see, oh, that's everything. Here it is, laid bare. Right? And if the original authors want to say, yeah, we are sticking to it, that specification is the right one. Out of 1,700, that's the only right one. And yes, there are a bunch of others that are possible. And they want to make that argument and they succeed, great. We're all on the same page. But if they try to make that argument, and a reviewer says, well, I'm looking at the specification curve and I'm realizing that's a very idiosyncratic specification and all the other ones I thought of were non-significant, that reviewer might push back. And now we have an argument before the entire field is like, ah, oh, what are we gonna do? It happens at the beginning. We learn from the beginning. Uh, this is less important, this is us using a technique to put a p-value on the number of specifications where we basically add a randomization feature to it and then do repeated simulations to find out how often uh, there's a result. Don't worry about it, it's in, in our paper. Um, so I go through all this and I say, all right, so if we do all this, it removes, by embracing the fact that there is ambiguity in specification, it removes it from the question about whether there's room for piacking. Because it's, all, it's making transparent in the same way that we said, make transparent what you measure. Make transparent the manipulations you have. This says, make transparent all of the analyses that were possible. And now when they're all on the table, now we can evaluate it. Until we have that, you can't really evaluate a single specification just because it is justifiable. All right? Okay. So here is my, my final covet. And this is going to be sort of a slight change of gears, but it's mostly to show this single example to make a point. Uh, that I thought about not presenting, but it's, I like the example, so you're stuck with my nonlinearity. Okay, so there's two ways you can p-hack. One is how to test a hypothesis, which is what I've been looking at, that is say, oh, I can specify it in different ways. The other one is to, is to, to change my hypothesis, right? And here is kind of like harking, uh, and, but it's kind of like p-hacking. You'll see what I mean. It's basically saying, taking the data and saying like, ah, I've got it. This is the thing right here, and, you're, and because you can move that around, this allows you to camp capitalize on pure sampling error. Okay, so specification curve helps the former, and I'm gonna argue that in this domain where it's observational data, uh, the latter is totally impervious. How is it impervious? Here's my example. All right, I'm gonna, I was looking for observa an observational finding that is necessarily false, that is you will not believe it for a second that it could be true, uh, and yet it's going to look like it it looks robust. How do we do that? So here, oh, here's my false lit review. That's uh, it, clearly casual. So priming exists, agreed. Does it happen outside the lab? That sounds like a paper. 
Uh, fact one, even numbers are perceived as warmer than odd numbers. This is actually a, a true fact, believe it or not. Um, uh, cold minds don't read the horoscopes. That sounds, you know, plausible also. All right, so now we've got our lit review prediction. Therefore, uh, if you are randomly assigned with an even number, you're more likely to read the horoscope. You say, that sounds like a weird thing. How can I do it? Thank you, GSS. Uh, the GSS <laughs> does both. It randomly assigns numbers to people, and it asks them, how often do you read the horoscope? <laughs> Turns out uh, that uh, even-numbered respondents uh, read the horoscope more often, 15% more likely to read the horoscope. Uh, the p-value is less than 0.01, so p-curve, which is something else I've worked on, would be like, oh, you got me, it looks like good evidence, we're all sold, uh, and you say, great. But notably, what happens if we try to like, check for robustness by looking at specifications? It's only going to look better. So here it is, imagine now it's in a journal. So we say, great, here's the impact of having an even number on uh, reading the, the horoscope. So there's our basic estimate. Uh, highly significant, and you say, okay, but maybe that's just because uh, you're leaving out demographics, like older adults uh, or men or women read the horoscopes more, more than others. Let's put those in, and you see uh, the estimate stays the same. Also, you see uh, men read the horoscope more than women. That's kind of weird. I had no idea, uh, but that's, and that might be true. It's also a strong effect. Um, you're like, okay, but what about some other things? What about belief in God or happiness? We put those in there. Nope, it's robust to that as well. What about whether you've taken college classes? Nope, it's robust to that as well. This table, my guess, is more persuasive, more robust than most findings you will see reported in a similar fashion. That is, our core finding isn't just significant for all of them, the effect size is similar. You say, even with these obvious covariates, and they're good covariates, right? Because they are correlated with the dependent variable. Like, you're like, nah, gender, good one to have in there. Age, good one to have in there, and so on. Right, you say, but still the effect is just as big. And this is where you say, that, well, sorry, taking the, the inference there should first of all be that you should find that scary, right? Because that says, wait a minute, someone could have a truly false finding and make it look as good or better than a true, true finding, right? Okay, so what do you do? Here's where you say, well, for experiments, obviously you should pre-register. Pre-registration helps. If I pre-registered the horoscope hypothesis in some way, like the GS is about to be collected, and I get that, amazing, right? But you can't usually do that with observational data. So instead, this is where I, I am in the usual position of strongly endorsing conceptual replication, right? So if you have a belief that even numbers are operating on horoscopes because of priming and warmth and whatnot. All right, well now we have a brainstorming session where we say, what else do you predict? And maybe we can test that in the same data set. But it has to be that way. The specification curve isn't gonna solve it. Okay, so multiple specifications are justifiable. I argue, test all of them. When you're collecting data prospectively, pre-register. And if you can't pre-register, what I've finally come to for this, I would say, why can't you? Just pre-register. <laughs> um, and I th and I think that's and I think that's it. Thanks. <laughs> Just, do I have time for one or zero? Very quick. Half a question. Then. Uh, go for it. Do you have to do all that manually, or is there a program that does all this? Work? Yeah. So so uh, that is a short question and a short answer. Yes, they, we do not have to do it all manually. There's a script that we have for Stata, and we're working on to have an R so that you can. Uh, you just have to build your data set the right way and then it goes out. Yeah. And it takes, it takes a day to run it or whatever, but yeah. yeah. Cool. Thanks, everybody.